Inevitably, in some areas, the gunmen were waiting for the troops. At Smithfield, several shots were fired after a large bomb had exploded in the bus station. Royal Marine commandos dashed forward and returned fire, but they didn't claim any hits. The troops' main fear was that other devices might be around with delayed action fuses. Similar scenes were repeated all over the city centre. The explosions hit all parts of the city. This bomb had been hidden in a hijacked bread van in Botanic Gardens, a pleasant suburb near the university. Although many shops in the area were damaged, there were no casualties. It was one of the three explosions where the terrorists are known to have given a warning. estimated at between three and four hundred pounds was left in a bakery van and virtually completed the destruction of the city's main shopping center. It had been parked outside a ballroom and office block by two men who carried trays of cakes into a butcher's shop and gave a warning. The street and buildings had been evacuated and the only casualties were four soldiers with minor cuts. Seven shops were wrecked and a water main in the road under the van burst. Parts of the van were found in a street over 500 yards away. It was the last straw for many local businessmen. Since they complained last week about a total lack of security in the city centre, cars and people entering the area have been carefully searched. And the army admitted tonight that the bread van was stopped at two checkpoints on its way into the city centre and found to be clear. So either the explosives were very cleverly concealed or put into the van after it had passed the checkpoint. No, this action today will fill all of us with abhorrence. It is revolting and obscene. But that meeting, which had been laid on a little while before, was designed to see what are the terms on which we could get an immediate ceasefire and possibly a more long-term settlement. But nothing can excuse this action today. But in view of this action, surely anything that they said to you can, can't be taken seriously. Uh, well, I can't disclose what was said. I have reported uh, to Mr. Whitelaw about the meeting, and indeed I've been in touch with Mr. Whitelaw from Manchester tonight, as soon as the news came through. But uh, there is no ceasefire at the moment. I hope we can get a ceasefire as quickly as possible. This is going to make it infinitely more difficult, and everyone must show out a restraint now. Your talks were with the leaders of the provisional IRA, yet it would seem today that the rank and file have taken over. I wouldn't be sure of that. I think there are divided councils in the very top level of the provisionals, and that was one of the problems I was trying to get over, to try and, if possible, move them towards a, an immediate ceasefire, or even a ceasefire a little later, uh, and to uh, indicate to them that, you know, to make very clear to them, painfully clear, that uh, we can't have a dealings while this sort of thing is going on. I don't think it was a rank and file taking over. I think whoever's giving the orders has his orders carried out. We haven't yet had, of course, a full report at the moment we're recording this of what has happened. All the signs are that they are responsible. There may be others involved as well. But on the assumption that they're responsible, I think it is that they are still going on to the bitter end, and it's a very, very bitter end. 